Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, wherever you are going to listen to this podcast or view this uh, recording. Uh, today, uh, again, before I even start, my name is Guy Christian Agbo. Uh, I am uh, having a conversation today, a 60 minute conversation with my big brother, my elder brother, uh, brother PLO uh, Lumumba. He is Nairobi, I'm in New York, but we're going to have a special talk uh, about the problems uh, 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 of illicit financial flow, corruption, and good governance in Africa. So uh, before I even uh, continue, let me just uh, introduce quickly uh, uh, my brother, Mr. Patrick, Professor Patrick uh, Losh Otieno Lumumba, he is a Kenyan who served as a director of the Kenyan Anti-Corruption Commission from September 2010 to August 2011. Now, since 2014, uh, Professor Lumumba is the director of the Kenyan School of Law. Uh, he uh, is an eloquent panelist. He is a Pan-Africanist, just as I am. We have that in common. We are both lawyers. We have that in common too. And again, we love Africa. So today, we are just going to have this kind of conversation as we do in Africa, where we sit under a big tree and just talk between brothers. So, uh, Brother Piero, welcome to Goal 16 Podcast. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. But I must point out that I actually uh, also finished my tenure at the Kenya School of Law two years ago. Wonderful. I'm now in full-time practice and serving Africa. Oh, beautiful. So thank beautiful. you for organizing this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Pielo. So uh, to start, let me just ask you this. How are you doing? Uh, well, um, I would say that I am doing reasonably well. Of course, in this period of Corona, doing well is a word that is used very cautiously because because we don't enjoy the freedom of movement that we are accustomed to. I can't move out of Nairobi, for example, I'm marooned here by dint of a government directive in order to contain corona. I can't fly to Nigeria or to any other country in the world. And of course, we've got to engage in physical distancing, wear masks, sanitize, and all those things that everybody in the world is doing. So in light of all those things, let me say I'm doing reasonably well, those notwithstanding. <laughs> wonderful, <Yes. laughs> wonderful. We thank God. We yeah. thank God for that, Brother, brother Piel. Mm -hmm. So um, my first question to you, I mean, with respect to our, to our, to our, to our team, um, I wanted to know what, um, uh, uh, what is the, 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 the status of Kenya or East Africa in general with respect to you know, the fight against illicit financial flow? Kenya, like many African countries, long recognized that illicit financial flows is something that harms the economy and undermines democracy. And you will remember that in the year 2013 in Merida, in fact, it was in 2013, 2003 in Merida, Mexico, when the United Nations Convention Against Corruption came into being, Kenya was one of the first countries to just not just sign but ratify. Mm -hmm. And the African Convention for Preventing and Combating Corruption, Kenya also was a leader in that regard in terms of putting together the East African uh, Protocol Against Corruption. Kenya was also in the forefront and into Kenya adopted POKAMLA. I think that is the, the shorthand uh, word that we use for the international instrument that deals with the financial flows. So that if you look at the architecture of the institution that we have to fight that, Kenya does have uh, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission whose mandate includes dealing with illicit financial flows and in addition to that, under the aegis of the Central Bank of Kenya, we do also have specialized bodies whose agenda is to monitor individual personal accounts, individual accounts rather, 
And it is the law in Kenya today that when one receives an amount which is one million Kenya shillings or above, then that must be reported to the specialized agency. And one million Kenya shillings is 10,000 United States dollars. And, and that, I think, in itself is indicative of the kind of premium that the Kenyan government has put in place in order to ensure that illicit financial flows are dealt with. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, now, um, uh, Prof. Uh, Brother Pielo, um, you have been sometime compared to Mr. Bannon, Steve Bannon. I don't know if you know who Mr. Steven Ban uh, Steve Bannon is. But yes. he is, uh, yeah, so you've been compared to him because uh, some have heard you say that uh, Africa must be first and uh, or that, uh, you know, we should make Africa great again. Why did you say that? No. I say that deliberately because when you look at the potential of Africa and her current state, it, it saddens one. You look at the environment in many countries, and if you choose any country, and the country that I love choosing is the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. This is perhaps the richest resource country in the world with anything between 34 to 40 trillion of resources under her belly. And yet it is notoriously known as the, one of the poorest nations on earth. You look at a country such as Niger or many other countries, one can go on and on. And you discover that the... Uh, so let's, um, let's talk about uh, yeah. uh, uh, the status of human rights within the context of, uh, of, of Africa. Where, where, where do you think our current government, all across Africa, where do you think we stand? Do we, lo I mean, do we, respect human rights as we're supposed to? Or, you know, what, what is your own opinion on that? We, we have had a crisis in terms of respect for human rights, as you know. Many African countries uh, having, of course, regained their independence and were acceded to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 1966 Protocol universal on, on the Preservation of Human Rights. And we also have our own African Convention that deal with human rights, complete with a court for human rights which sits in Banjul in the Gambia. But you will note that the, many of these instruments have been honored in breach including constitution, because many countries in Africa today have constitution which have chapters that deal with human rights and only allow for derogation from certain rights in cases of emergency. But we have seen in peacetime that there has been derogation, people disappear, people are subjected to inhuman and degrading treatment and nothing happens in the domestic courts. And, and, and this in itself is indicative of our proclivity, particularly the leaders, to ignore what is in the statute books and to do only that which is necessary for keeping them in. We have seen this such as Niger, Mauritania. We have seen cases of such abuses in Eritrea. We have seen instances of similar abuses in the Sudan, and we know the other cases, for example, in Chad of Hissen Habre and of course Omar el Bashir in Sudan. So there is a sense in which, while in terms of improvement, we have seen improvement in many countries, we still have pockets of countries. I think that the, I'm, I'm back, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. What do you think mm -hmm. about uh, the, uh, the exchange, the current, uh, 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 the current conversation concerning uh, um, um, COVID-19, where you've seen president of, the president of Madagascar getting into a conversation with the other president trying to coordinate? I thought that was quite interesting. I've never seen something like that. You. 
No, you know, that in my view was amazing. The courage that President Rajwell had, the conviction that his own scientists are capable of coming up with a cure for COVID-19, that is what makes countries great. First of all, you've got to believe in yourself. Of course, there'll be no shortage of naysayers and doubting Thomases, but he was able, with the benefit of sound scientific advice, to engage a number of chosen presidents from across the continent of Africa. And as we speak now, the World Health Organization is beginning to say, this deserves to be examined. There are those who are not even waiting for it to be examined, as we have seen in the case of Equatorial Guinea and, uh, and, and Tanzania, and, and I believe Guinea-Bissau. And that is good. So that what we should be hearing from African countries, and particularly the African Union, is a message and messages of support so that if this is a cure in its embryonic stages, what we ought to be doing is to ensure that we improve it. If it is now in a liquid form, how can we make it to be in a tablet form? And, and how can we develop this particular cure to a level that it will be as potent as we desire it to be? And, and, and I'm quite impressed. It is also indicative that Africa is capable of being a pioneer in the, uh, in the area of pharmaceutics. You know, the big boys such as Roche, such as uh, Novartis, such as Johnson & Johnson will not be happy and I'm quite certain they'll send quite a number of people to try and deride and dismiss that particular cure from Madagascar to say that it does not, it does not conform to recognize protocols and that kind of thing. It cannot be certified. But to me, that ought to be ignored. It is the duty of Africa to now support Madagascar and our research scientists in various universities and our five CDCs across mm -hmm. the world ought to be in the forefront of supporting what has taken place. There is always room for improvement. We who are not scientists, our duty is to raise our voices to commend that research funds ought to be put together and to be developed to help the people of Madagascar and the scientists to improve that particular uh, uh, product. Okay, bro. I mean, but brother, I will give it to you. Uh, however, I just have to add, I just have a different <coughs> approach. We are scientists, but we are yes. social scientists. You know, with yes. different to them who are, you know, different kind of scientists. But we are also, both of us and others are social scientists as well. So um, let's yeah. jump here. Yeah, let's jump on uh, on, yeah. on this question of uh, demonetization. I, I I want to know what was the demonetization all about in Kenya. Could you could you help me to understand that, please? Let Let me use the example of India in order to compare with Kenya, so that we can see that although we were demonetizing, it was from different approaches. When President Modi chose to demonetize, he talked about what they described as black money in India. Right. There was a lot of money that people were keeping out of the main banking system. Mm -hmm. The net effect is that it was undermining the value of the Indian rupee. And right. this, this money was therefore available to individuals who would use it outside of the mainstream economy to the detriment of the Indian economy. Yeah. There is a sense in which that is to be contradistinguished from the Kenyan environment. When the constitution of Kenya 2010 came into force, one of the clauses that was in the constitution is that the Kenyan currency should not bear the portrait of any living person, indeed of any human being. It should uh, bear the images of animals and other national features. It was delayed that because from the year 2010 through to the year 2019, almost a period of nine years, nothing was done about it. But there was also the silent, of the, there were also silent voices which were saying that many Kenyans had kept money in their houses or they were using forex bureaus or such other institution for purposes of keeping money outside of the main banking system. And therefore, the government, in its wisdom, chose, number one, to implement 
the, the constitutional requirement, but also it used it as a way of mopping up this money so that those who are keeping money in their houses who are told, you bring it back to us, but tell us where you got it from. Sure. And in the recent statistics that we have seen, it is something possibly in the billion of, in the, in, in, in the tune of over six billion, my, my statistic may not be right, but in the billion of monies that were deemed to be in circulation. But when there was a demonetization, it never came back into the mainstream. Indicative of the fact, you know, there was a lot of money, illicit money, which was being hoarded, if you may, by individuals and possibly institutions. As to whether it has helped the economy, that is a different debate. Because typically, you'll find that the people who are engaged in determining whether the economy has been affected positively or otherwise would be IMF, World Bank, with comments from Moody and McKinsey and Deloitte and Tersh and Ernest and Young. And, and, and of course, typically, they don't come with a single voice. So that one cannot say that the Kenyan economy is the better or the poorer because of the, the, the demonetization. And coupled with COVID-19 now, many things will disappear and you'll never know what actually happened even when an exercise such as that has been undertaken. Right. Thank you. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, concerning our relationship as a continent with uh, mm. other uh, uh, big, uh, big countries like uh, China, like uh, the, the, the US, like uh, France, uh, UK and Canada. Now, we, we have this situation of COVID-19 going on where Africa, which is uh, 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 poorly uh, performing economically because we don't have the funds to develop what we need to do, um, we owe a lot of money to, this, uh, to these big countries. Do you think it, it's a good policy for China, for example, because I believe, I don't know the numbers exactly, but we owe more money to China than we owe to any other country. Um, the way China has treated uh, some Africans uh, uh, in their country, in, in Guangzhou and so forth, do you think it's good policy for them to seize this opportunity and uh, 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 reduce or uh, completely erase African debt? Let me answer that question uh, with the some kind of background. Right. You know, many times African countries, when dealing with China, want to emphasize their sovereignty. Right. We are Burundi, we are Chad, we are Eritrea, we are all these. But the recent events in the world have demonstrated, even to those who do not think and see clearly, that many of these countries, when they deal with Africa, they simply see one continent. Yeah. That is why when Putin summons, he summons African leaders to Sochi and mm -hmm. deals with them as if they were one. Mm -hmm. When Angela Merkel is dealing with Africa, she summons African leaders to Berlin. When President Xi is dealing with African leaders, he summons them to Africa, to, to, to Beijing as one. When Prime Minister of Japan is dealing with them, he summons them to Tokyo, as right. if Africa was a single country. That right. in itself should tell African countries that your strength lies in this unity. Because what China does is that under the glare of the press, it deals with you as if you are a single unit, but right. it to the individual countries and dango carrots. They go to Nigeria, dango a carrot. They go to Ghana, dango a carrot. And these carrots are in the form of infrastructural development. Mm -hmm. And a good example that I can give is in the area of railways. And they have been very good at building railways across Africa. A few years ago, during the administration of President Jakaya Mbisho Kikweta in Tanzania, they had signed a deal to do the port of Mtuara and Bagamoyo. When the administration of President John Joseph Magufuli came into power, they looked at that particular agreement and they said, this is unfair. And they simply threw it away and started negotiating with the tax and using their own resources, which tells you that quite a number of these contracts that are being negotiated by 
uh, the Chinese to build infrastructure, whether it's roads or bridges or stadia or in the mining sector, if you go beyond infrastructure, they are skewed in favor of China. Mm -hmm. And we have seen the experience of China with Sri Lanka, how they lent money to Sri Lanka and they now are moving into the port to control it. So going forward, it is incumbent upon Africa to ensure that the relationship between Africa, because trade is universal. Even when mm -hmm. we are talking about uh, being independent, we'll be independent so that when we trade, we trade from a position of strength. And some of these loans that have been given to us by China have been given to us on the basis of usurious thumbs. It's like right. Shylock lending you money and they'll demand their pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. And they must be renegotiated. Mm -hmm. Because if they are not renegotiated, several generations of Africans will not be able to repay these loans, even when the economic life of the infrastructure has long gone. So this is my concern with China. And the Chinese are very clear. The Chinese know what they want. They move towards it very deliberately. They are winning every game. And if you allow me to use the word game in the economic chessboard, and we are losing every game on the economic chessboard. And the reason why we are doing so, we are negotiating as single countries, having bilateral arrangements, but yet China, in the scheme of things, still wants to deal with us as if we are little children. We must put a stop to that. And it can only be put to a stop if we begin to negotiate, if not under the aegis of the African Union, at least under the aegis of the regional bodies, ECOWAS, SADC, East African Community. And that is possible. It is, it is possible to negotiate for 14 countries under ECOWAS to negotiate as a single unit with components for each country. But you send your team of negotiators to do it from that standpoint. Okay. Now, uh, let's, let's talk a, a little bit about uh, um, uh, the context of uh, financial mobilization of uh, resources within, uh, 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 within Kenya or within certain countries within uh, uh, in East Africa. Um, I've, I've collaborated with uh, uh, investigative journalists on issues concerning uh, uh, tax treaty with Mauritius. I wanted to have your opinion on the issue of uh, tax treaty between Kenya and Mauritius. You know, Mauritius has, uh, the Mauritian took a decision several years ago mm -hmm. that it was going to compete with the Cayman yes. Island of this world, with the Gansis of this world, with the Chilichestein and Luxembourg. Right. And the net effect is that they introduced rules and regulations whose agenda was to provide tax havens, mm -hmm. including citizenship that is pegged on investment. And okay. the danger with tax havens is that you then find easy avenues for migration of funds, so that what then happens is that many companies, particularly on the East African shore, will then move their headquarters to Mauritius. Exactly. Or if they are South Africans or Gambians, they move their headquarters to Mauritius. Their mm -hmm. banking regulations are lax, mm -hmm. so that even if you relax, you, are, you, you tighten your own banking regulations in your home country, the mm -hmm. home of origin of this fund will always be Mauritius. So yeah. you appear to be winning on one side, but you are being defeated by these tax regulations. Mm -hmm. And that is why I have a problem with having these regimes, because it is, it, they are regimes that actually make nonsense of Bokamla, for example. If yes. I wanted to establish a company now, I would headquarter the company in Mauritius. Exactly. Once I've headquartered the company in Mauritius, and the funds are coming Mauritius into the Kenyan government, then I'll have a legitimate explanation for the source of that money, and you can't question it, because that is a sovereign country whose rules and regulations uh, guiding movement of funds cannot be questioned in a Kenyan jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. it is significant, therefore, because Madagascar is within the SADAC movement, 
how do we ensure that within the SADAC movement we are able to control and to harmonize our rules and regulations so that you don't have Mauritius doing its thing and Seychelles doing its thing and meanwhile Botswana and South Africa are doing their own thing and Lesotho is doing its own thing uh, which are all undermined by the lax and accommodative uh, Mauritian rules and regulation. But the real world doesn't think the way we are thinking. Right. The real world is also very pretentious. The real world will tell you we don't want this, but those who control the world still need Mauritius, they mm -hmm. still need Macau, they still need Singapore, they mm -hmm. still need Gansi, they still need these little countries where you can hide your money. Switzerland, of course, played that role for a very long time. And, and, mm -hmm. and now it's beginning to have competition in Asia and in Africa because some countries have discovered that that is the only way. For example, Mauritius, when sugar was no longer the thing that you want to deal with, mm -hmm. you now create retirement homes and you become a financial hub with, mm -hmm. with, with, with the loose rules and regulations, the Las mm -hmm. Vegas of money. Right, right. So, uh, uh just following uh, within that same, uh, that same line, uh, do you think it's time for Africa to define its own international taxation? You know, let, I'm, I'm going to answer this question uh, with some caution. Right. And uh, I warn myself that when we talk about Africa, we are not talking about a single unit. Right. You know, as much as you and me would love it. Right. That when we talk about Africa, we are dealing with 54 uh, countries, yes. very disparate regimes. Mm -hmm. So that the taxation regime in the DRC is possibly very, is not possibly different from the taxation regime in Cote d'Ivoire mm -hmm. and, and uh, is different from Central African Republic. And that is why I think that when you look at the regional bodies, which you yourself are familiar with, yes. if you look at ECOWAS, mm -hmm. some of the things that you wanted to do was to move into a single customs union. Right. Then you harmonize your taxation, you have a single market. From a single market, you allow for free movement of goods. Right. Then you move into a single currency, which ECOWAS was trying to do through the ECO until it was hijacked by the French. By the, French the same yes. thing was happening in East Africa, that first of all, the East African Treaty says that we start with a customs union, mm -hmm. we, move, we move into a single market and ultimately a political federation and have a single monetary union. Because when you do that, it means that you have brought all the country's economy to a certain level where mm -hmm. the shilling in Kenya is the same in value as the shilling in Tanzania. The right. same with the eco. Right. That the eco in Nigeria is the same as the eco in the Gambia. And that if you go down south and you are the puller, the puller that I have in Lisangola. But as long as we don't have that, then you have problems. And that is why I think think the Africa, which is aimed to ensure that we have a coordinated approach. It may take maybe 10 years to, 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 to harmonize these economies, but at least we'll begin in terms of movement. Once you begin to deal with the tariff and non-tariff barriers, then you begin to remove the boundaries and you collapse these boundaries, and ultimately you can have unified monetary system, common markets. Once you have a common market, you move into single currencies. Once you move into single currencies, then you can operate. But you have seen, even with the European Union, that yes. a single currency will have its own problems. So yes. the That's Greek true. tragedy. That's true. Mm -hmm. that be bailed out by the Germans. And you remember, it had to be bailed out by the rest of Europe. So there is a sense in which, in a forum such as this, of course, we cannot go into the finer details. Right. But we can have a broad brush treatment of it in a manner that can be consumed by people who are not technicians. That's true. But it's desirable and it's necessary. It is only then 
that we are capable of running real economies. And I want to conclude by saying this. Right mm -hmm. now, oil is dollar denominated. Right. So that when Nigeria produces oil, it is the dollars, the dollar that will determine what Nigeria actually does. <coughs> Suppose ultimately we mm -hmm. move out of the dollar environment and go into the gold environment, or if you have an African currency into the Afro environment, it will be a totally different kettle of fish, and Africa would be the richer for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so since we are within, uh, we still within the taxation uh, issues, I wanted to ask you about a phenomenon that I've seen uh, a, a lot of time on social media, where we have all these uh, pastors, uh, pastors in um, in Africa whether you are in Ghana, whether you are in Zambia, you know, from all over Africa, ex, uh, you know, exposing their wealth from, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I get so, so, um, you know, so frustrated with it. And I'm wondering if you think uh, various African governments should be taxing these individuals. You know, <laughs> If, if, even if you look at the Bible in Paul's second letter to Timothy at chapter 3, he says that there will be times such as these where they'll emerge men who will be peddling kinds of truths and they'll be lovers of themselves. And today across Africa, you find them. You come to Kenya, look at the number of denominations. You go to Nigeria or to Ghana. I remember when I was in Nigeria driving from Abeokuta through into, in the Ogun state, coming state. to Lagos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the number of churches, and I've seen this in, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in every country, for every one industry, perhaps you have 20 churches where husband and wife are prophets and prophetesses. Yes. And in one day, they have all manner of service. So that what you will permit me to call the Jesus industry. Yes. Is the biggest industry in Africa. Yes. And there are many men and women who, I do not, you know, when you are talking about matters of religion, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't want to, to annoy them because they may have a true calling. <laughs> from That's the true. evidence that I have. <laughs> That's true. From the evidence that I have, many of them, Many of them have not been called by God. They have called themselves. Yes, that's and, true. And, and because they have called themselves, they are serving themselves. And they are manipulating and abusing the word of God for personal glorification and for material aggrandizement. And that is why recently, I think as recently as last year, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda said, nobody is going to be allowed to run a church if you don't have a degree in Mm -hmm. Agree. You don't need a degree in theology to be called by God, sure. but it was his own response to the proliferation of these things called mm -hmm. churches, mm -hmm. which are sprouting everywhere. And you look at the congregation is impoverished, but the pastors and the clergy are multi-millionaires running jets and, and, and claiming to have performed all miracles except mm -hmm. the resurrection of Christ himself. This, yeah. this to me is something that ought to, to be dealt with. And, yes. and it, it requires education, yeah. even on the part of, 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 of the population. Now I understand why Karl Marx said that religion is the opium for the poor. He yes. must have meant that when people are frustrated and they are poor, they will emerge from amongst them a few men and women who will be selling hope. And when they are selling hope, it is unachievable, it is a mirage. Mm -hmm. And they simply make their lives and their heavens here on earth as you are waiting to go to heaven. And I think mm -hmm. right now that such institutions should be subjected to a contribution to the national coffers because mm -hmm. They are earning money. And if they contribute to the national coffers by way of taxation, even if it is at a lower percentage than everybody else, it could go into social program. We now have COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And across Africa, I'm not seeing the multi-millionaire religious leaders contributing to the national efforts. Mm -hmm. It is the businessmen who are contributing to the national effort. 
All these miracle workers, many of them, whether legitimate or illegitimate, are not making a contribution. I know the organized churches, such as the Catholic Church and others, uh, have their own relief units and are doing good work quietly. But many of these individuals, many of them are now appearing on television and encouraging us to pay tight through pay bills and mm -hmm. other media, but they are not sharing what they have heard before. And I think that there is a case for it because they are <coughs> mocking God. Some of them are good, but many of them are mocking God. And, and yeah. it is not for us to punish them, but it's for us to point it out if yes. they are impoverishing God's people. Yes, the church will say amen to that. The church will say amen. Yes, yeah, it sure. did. <laughs> yes, I'm sure the church will say amen. Yeah. Now, brother, let, let's, let's talk about, um, uh, you know, the status of democracy in Africa. Uh, do you yes. think it's time for Africa to define its own democracy? I have no doubt in my mind. I was uh, just this morning listening to a very old footage mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, I was listening to Odume Guojuku. And, and, and okay. whether you liked Odume or not, or the not, man yes. was eloquent, the man was uh, good. Yes, so he, he was. He was explaining the, that is after, actually after the, the Civil War, just when he had mm -hmm. come back, it was two years to his death and he was saying, Mm -hmm. that part of the problem that we had and we had in Nigeria was talk about the Nigerian case mm -hmm. and you're saying that part of the problem that we had was the architecture of what we inherited from the British mm -hmm. because that particular structure and architecture was designed to fail and was in was conflictual and after I listened to Odume Gwojuku mm -hmm. I listened to Jerry Rawlings and Jerry exactly. Rawlings was explaining why in 1979 he had to seize power. And after that, I listened to Kenneth David Kaunda, who himself was never overthrown, but was defeated at a first multi-party election and conceded power. And what am I doubt of it? That essentially, we must have a different governance system. Yes. And the explanation by Ujuku was, in my view, quite telling. He said, giving the Nigerian history, mm -hmm. that when during independence Nigeria had three regions, mm -hmm. it is ethnicity that was the dividing factor. So that in the north, it was Ahmadu Bello who mm -hmm. was governing from there. Then he sent Tafawa Balewa to the central government. In the West, although Nambi Azikiwe won the election, it was not accepted, and Akintola ended, ended, ended up being there mm -hmm. with, with the Awolo on that side, on that side. It was also Nambi Azikiwe. So that the ethnicity, and, and, and Kenya is one such country <coughs> where ethnicity defines politics. It is now creeping into Malawi. It is creeping into Zambia and many African countries. What does that say? to answer your question. Must we define democracy to mean multi-party politics? Must we define ourselves when I hear us, particularly those of us who have had the advantage of Western education, we are the ones who use this terminology, that he is right wing, he yes. is left wing. Right, left wing, he is left of center, right of center, whatever. What are those? Africans simply need a government where the people can participate in their governance and that particular system must incorporate certain realities. You have traditional chieftaincies. Can they be accommodated within that kind of infrastructure, that kind of political infrastructure? I think they can be. So it is, is the time when we must imagine. We must engage in disruptive thinking and begin to imagine differently. Nana Kobina Nketsia, who is himself a uh, professor of political science at the University of Cape Coast and a traditional ruler in Ghana, has written a book about the need for Africans to have their own paradigm of governance, which is democratic, allows for participation, but is not Eurocentric or Americocentric. It mm -hmm. can be done. Mm -hmm. and it can be achieved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perfect perfect 
Now let's, uh, uh, if you don't mind, let's talk about um, um, the situation in um, uh, the situation about, I mean, uh, the agenda 2063. Do you mm. do you think African country uh, will be able to 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 to, to make it happen? <clears throat> Let me answer that question by giving the background which you'll be familiar with. You remember right. that the UN, uh, I think in 2000, uh, came out with uh, the, the Millennium Development Goals, Millennium the Development 17 Goals, yes. Millennium yes. Development Goals, right. which were supposed to be achieved by the year 2015. Right. And of course, after the lapse of the 2015, it is only, I think, it is only Rwanda and possibly Mauritius and possibly Namibia and possibly Botswana who were able on the basis of the measurement that was given by the UN uh, capable of, of, did meet the Millennium Development Goals. We then had imposed on us the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And nobody can quarrel with those 17 Sustainable Development Goals because yeah. they address critical areas of our lives. In the same way that we cannot quarrel with Africa Agenda 2063, which mm -hmm. is founded on seven pillars. Mm -hmm. And those pillars address issues that you once again cannot quarrel with, if you are honest. Mm -hmm. They are talking about the things that are critical. We are talking about education. We are talking about culture. We are talking about health. We are talking about the environment. We are talking about natural resources. We are talking about human rights. We are talking about uh, research and development, fourth industrial revolution, robotics, <coughs> internet mm -hmm. of things, and all those things. Nobody can quarrel about with them. And my own view, therefore, is that a united Africa, and when we are using the word united, we are not being naive. Mm -hmm. We are simply meaning an Africa that is capable of identifying her priorities and having an implementation timetable which is time-bound. Mm -hmm. and capable of engaging in those areas which will help her move in that direction. Because Africa has been a laboratory of experiments. Mm -hmm. You remember the Lomé Convention of 1975 signed between Africa and the Caribbean and Europe. Lomé and Europe, Convention yeah. came, nothing sure. changed. Mm -hmm. You remember the Cotonou Convention. Exactly. which was the immediate success of the Lomé Convention. We yeah. assumed once again that Europe will develop us. You mm -hmm. remember Africa Growth Opportunity Act in Agoa, which Agoa, killed yeah. our textile industries. The yeah. textile industries that are independent you had in Kaduna no longer mm -hmm. exist. If yeah, you go yeah. to the textile industry that existed in Kenya or in Lesotho, death because mm -hmm. of Agoa. We are now making cotton to be consumed by American high stores and nothing for Africa. Instead, what we do is to, Im to, to import second-hand clothing Close, from clothing, Europe. Yeah, yeah. And we are key. Yeah. And so that, in my view, if you look at all those things, you, and, and Africa Agenda 2063 is actually a rehash of the Lagos Plan of Action. Mm -hmm. If you look at the 1980 Lagos Plan of Action, it is mm -hmm. saying exactly the same thing that Agenda 2063 is saying. Mm -hmm. But the beauty now is that we are moving towards operationalization. Mm -hmm. The appointment of a Secretary General of SCTFA is a good thing because, number one, the Secretariat is now going to begin to move into the direction of implementation. And a number of things have also happened in the recent past. You remember the opening of the African skies for right. aviation. Mm -hmm. for aviation. There was yeah. initially the Yamasukuru Initially, it was Yamasukuru agreement in Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. After Yamasukuru, Yamasukuru did not achieve much. We now mm -hmm. have the Kigali or protocol okay. on that. Yes. Kigali has also gone further. Kigali mm -hmm. has also told us that we need a single passport to allow for free movement of persons. Mm -hmm. And we are saying that if we begin to trade within Africa, mm -hmm. then Africa is going to ensure that most of the wealth is retained within Africa. Mm -hmm. that there is value addition. I know you imagine as much as I imagine. Mm -hmm. Look at the area of mobile telephony. Telephones, yeah. Yeah, just the, the entire, is a multi-billion industry. If That's you right. look at ATT, which is American, you look at Vodafone, which is English, 
you look mm -hmm. at Orange, which is French, you look at Tigo, their combined revenue is bigger than the economies of all African countries combined. Wow. And yet we are not participants in that regard. In that regard, The yes. ingredient that, that we use in our mobile phones, rare earth or coltan, it is the Democratic Republic of Congo, of Congo. produces. We yeah. don't produce a single mobile phone. Yet today, 90% of Africans own a mobile phone. Suppose mm -hmm. we were to produce it. Mm -hmm. Laptop or iPad or any of these things. It tells you that it mm -hmm. can be achieved. Today, under COVID, we are importing masks. And mm -hmm. the masks that are accepted by the World Health Organization are masks which re receive European standardization. And even beyond that, if you look at the area of pharmaceutical, the 15 largest pharmaceutical companies in the world are either European or American or Indian or Chinese. So that, that is why when they see Madagascar coming with something, they fear because once Africa makes a breakthrough, then they will be threatened. Look at the oil sector. You go mm -hmm. to Nigeria, who is uh, drilling the oil? If it is not Shell BP, it is Elf. If mm -hmm. it is not Elf, it is Total. If mm -hmm. it is not Total, it is Mobile Exxon. If it is not Mobile Exxon, it is uh, Start Oil of Norway. Mm -hmm. There is no African company that is among the big boys of the big girls. And mm -hmm. Agenda 2063 is telling us we've got to join. If you want to win a lottery, you must buy the ticket. And we have been praying and fasting to be a first world. No amount of prayer and fasting. We just must roll up our sleeves and begin to do things. The things that require effort can only be achieved through effort. Yeah. Now, let's, uh, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, our strong institutions within the context of Goal 16. Uh, now yes. um, I have some 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 reservation, some some reservations with respect to uh, to what is going on in Cote d'Ivoire right now yes. with uh, the AFDB. Um, what what is your sense of what's going on with uh, the management of Mr. Adesina? I know he may be a good person uh, personally, but uh, in terms of management style, the complication with uh, all the complaints, I understand that. Recently, he was exonerated by uh, the ethic committee, but there were some issues there with respect to the pressure that the person conducting this um, this ethics uh, investigation were pressured. I mean, was pressured by uh, by by Mr. Adesina lawyer. I mean, I don't understand why the uh, the 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 the, the uh, Mr. Adesina couldn't hire more Africans uh, who are professional, whether they are abroad, in, you know, in the US, in the UK, there are so many professionals like you to run the ethics committee, you know, to make it, I mean, why do we have to hire uh, people who are not from Africa? Even though I understand that some of them are uh, non-African members, right? But I don't think, I mean, you can, you can have such a, I mean, such a situation in Europe. You know, what, what are your thoughts? You know, Akinu Miyadesina, whom you know by reputation, just as I do as a former cabinet minister in the federal government, is an intelligent person, right. no doubt. Yes. Good intentions, understands his area very well. I, I, I wish him would say the right things. In the recent past, of course, I've heard him say some very useful things. But let us ask ourselves, who funds the African Development Bank? Yes. The African Development Bank is fundamentally an appendage of the IMF and, and, and the, uh, the Bretton Woods institution. And I'm told in the last one week, Ireland has also become a member of the FDB. Yes, exactly. The Republic of Ireland. Mm -hmm. So when, when you are running an organization where uh, those who give the real money are outsiders, your room for maneuver is circumscribed. And I want to believe that uh, Akinu Miyadeshina finds himself in such a situation so that even if he wanted to hire you or me or any other person, he doesn't have the complete authority to hire people purely on merit. There are mm -hmm. other 
geopolitical considerations which, which are taken into account. I'm, I'm quite certain that the International Monetary Fund will want to know who is hired. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is a big boy, is a, 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 a club of, of old boys. Yeah. And, 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 and to penetrate that club is not mm -hmm. very easy. To me, if we want, and, and sometimes it is very easy to, to say this from, from the armchair such as I am, which is sometimes useful, because I'm capable of, uh, you and me are capable of this kind of disruptive thinking, mm -hmm. that perhaps the funding model of the FFDB must be rethought. And mm -hmm. I was actually engaged in a conversation with a friend of mine on Friday. Okay. And I said, is it possible that if African countries were to say that 5% of our budget, not our GDP, 5% mm -hmm. of our annual budgets of the 54 African countries will be used to recapitalize AFDB. Mm -hmm. And if that were done consistently, I have no doubt in my mind that you would have 90% of the FDB being funded from the will within the continent. And the FDB, could, there are different funding models. We could even introduce taxes on mining, which would then go into the Africa Development Fund. And there is no shortage of good economies within and without the continent of Africa, but of African origin, who could create models which you could then ensure that FDB is properly funded and therefore we are capable of running an organization which organization is truly African. But as long as you have the IMF and the World Bank and the European Union funding the African Development Bank, even if you put the angel Gabriel himself to run the FDB, heavenly dance, but in matters of the FDB, you've got to listen to us or we withdraw our funding. Yeah. So Akinumi must find himself in such an unenviable position. Yeah. Okay, now let's stay within Cote d'Ivoire. You, uh, you probably heard, like I did, that um, uh, uh, the former prime minister was convicted of uh, some uh, corruption or something. But more importantly, that Cote d'Ivoire withdrew from the African Court of Human Rights. What are your thoughts on, on the minister? Didn't that, that yeah. the question. Yeah, <clears throat> no, the, I mean, you heard, like I did, like everybody else on the news, that the former prime minister, and he was former um, president of National Assembly, uh, Mr. Soro, Soro Gyom. He at uh, one point had uh, uh, conducted, was heading the- Soro. The, the, yes, Soro. The, he, was, he was heading the, the, the rebellion. Gyom yeah, okay, yeah, Soro. Gyom Soro, exactly, exactly, Gyom Soro. But the, the more, more, more importantly for me was the fact that Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, uh, withdrew from the African uh, Human Rights Court. I was. I wanted to have your opinion. Yes, uh, 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 Soros was uh, was. Uh, you are saying something about Guillaume Soros. Yes, yes. I was asking you if you think it is fair or normal for Cote d'Ivoire to withdraw from the African uh, Court of Human Rights because, as you know, uh, his lawyers, Soros' lawyers, were you know have complained, have sent. I mean, have. Uh, file a complaint against the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire uh, with respect to his remand right violation based on the African uh, 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 Convention against uh, 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 Human Rights by violation. And when the decision came from Cote d'Ivoire, from the African court, Cote d'Ivoire decided to withdraw. And I wanted to have your comment or your thought on that specific withdrawal. <coughs> Look, it's, it's very, you and me know the, the history of uh, George Soros and, and yes, the exactly. struggles with what and, and, and uh, the accusation of court that he was secessionist at that time. Right. My own view is that it is most unfortunate that African countries enter into this continental agreement and they hold the view that those institutions must decide, must make decisions which are to their liking. My understanding is that once you put together a court, then you've got to respect the decisions of that institution. 
right. the case of Soros, the reason why his lawyers went to the Africa Court of Human Rights is because they took the view that the domestic courts were so compromised and so politically affiliated with the Ouattara regime that they would never make a decision in his favor. Yeah. So the Continental Court, to which Cote d'Ivoire was a, was a party, has made a decision. And then they make the decision to withdraw. So it appears to me that the way that our countries want to operate is that once they have put together an institution, then those institutions must do their bidding. And that is very sad because it serves to weaken African courts. You, you saw, for example, one of the reasons why people are running to the ICC is because they say the, they take the view that African institutions are weak. And it's yeah. the action such as we have seen from the administration of Alice and Watara that make these institutions very weak. We saw recently even Isen Habre. Isen Habre was tried, I think, uh, it, was it in Senegal? In Senegal, yeah. Uh, uh, using universal jurisdiction. And even Omar el Bashir. In Omar el Bashir, we say that Omar should go to the ICC because we think the courts in the Sudan will not be sufficiently bold and independent to deal with it. It is very sad what has happened. And I thought that somebody as exposed as, as Watara would think differently. But I'm not surprised. I'm not su surprised because Watara in the recent past has also demonstrated his, procl his proclivity to being manipulated by the French. You mm -hmm. saw what he did <clears throat> by undermining the ECO, and he yep. was easily persuaded by the Macron of France, and they launched something called an ECO, which was right. very different from the one that was contemplated by ECOWAS. Yeah. So this kind of behavior is very consistent with leaders who are essentially still comprehend the bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. working at the behest of um, their former colonial masters. Very sad indeed. And I hope that this is one of the issues that will be discussed at the next uh, meeting of the heads of states and government of the African Union. We okay. should not undermine African <clears throat> institutions, we should strengthen them. Right, right. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, what are your final thoughts, what may be your final thought with respect to what the African diaspora you know, we have a huge African diaspora here in the U.S., uh, whether they are from Kenya, um, Nigeria, Cameroon, um, from uh, Ethiopia. What, 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 are, what, what can they do to help these, Africans, uh, these African institutions, you know, become very, 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 very sufficient on themselves and very solid, you know, to help Africa grow? and get to where Africa needs to be. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I've realized, particularly in the last two months, not that I did not know about it, yeah. that the most organized Africans, the Africans who feel the pain for Africa publicly, mm -hmm. uh, are sons and daughters in the diaspora. Yes. I've seen the different fora that have been created by African Americans, or rather Africans in the Caribbean, right. in North America to include Canada, the United States of America, Europe, and those who are even in Latin America. And as I speak to you now, I know quite a number of diaspora initiatives that are now making plans to be in Africa, to have footprints in Africa. Because if you, you may know these better than I, than I do, but I think that there are millions of Africans in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And they are to be found in every sector. If you want doctors, they are there. If you want engineers, they are there. If you want lawyers, they are there. If you want economists, they are there. If you want business people, they are there. If you want astrophysicists, they are there. If you want nurses, they are there. There is not a single sector in which you don't find some of our best men and women outside of the continent. One of the things that ought to be done, which I knew was being done, is that the diasporans should be given formal recognition by the African Union 
and by the regional bodies. I already know that many countries have deliberately now created desks, even in embassies, to deal with diaspora issues. All these are very good moves, but if it could be allowed that the African, uh, the, the, the people in the diaspora of African origin could have a seat at the Organization of African Union, or rather the African Union, even by way of observer status, we could give them observer status by region. A representative from North America, a representative from Europe, a representative from Latin America, a representative from the Caribbean, and they are invited to every city of the AU. Even these funds that we keep on talking about can be marshaled by our men and women in the diaspora. Why do I say so? Mm -hmm. I now know, for example, that in my country, Kenya, the remittance by Kenyans from outside of the country is perhaps the second highest foreign exchange honor for Kenya. It could be true for Ghana, it could yeah. be true for Zimbabwe, yeah. it could be true for Nigeria, mm -hmm. it's true for very... In Ethiopia, for example, I stand to be corrected, but I'm aware that the Ethiopians in the diaspora were part of the very intimate process of the building of their Renaissance Dam, which is going to generate 10,000 megawatts of power. The Eritreans, the Eritreans in the diaspora particularly in the Scandinavian countries, the highest foreign exchange honor for Eritrea is remittances from their men and women in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. That is one of the ways in which we are going to save ourselves. And the human resource there, the quality of those men, mm -hmm. if they were to step into the continent of Africa, you would be amazed in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I have no doubt in my mind that is the miss is the block is one of the blocks that we need in reconstructing our continent. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you a politically incorrect question because I will say Please that do. that way. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I, I've heard you talked a lot about uh, you talked a lot about uh, African uh, Africa as a continent being at a dinner table. So my yeah. question to you is: Is there a time when Africa will stop being eaten at a dinner table? Recent history has demonstrated that nobody invites you to the dinner table. Mm -hmm. You get crushed. Mm -hmm. Nobody invited China. In fact, if you want to join that dinner table, there'll be no shortage of people who want to shut you out. Mm -hmm. But you can do things where they have no choice mm -hmm. but to open the door for you. And that is exactly what China did. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what the United Arab Emirates did. That is exactly what Brazil did. That is exactly what Chile did in the 1980s. That is exactly what Japan did. That is exactly what South Korea did. That is exactly what Singapore did. Nobody is in the business of inviting people to the dinner table. Once you've done certain things, they will know that their meeting is incomplete without you, and they'll invite you to the G7, not for a photo opportunity, but because you are part of the decision-making process. They'll invite you to the G20 because mm -hmm. decisions cannot be made for you. Nobody is in that business. So if we want to be at the dinner table as diners, mm -hmm. we must do things that the world cannot ignore. Mm -hmm. Then, lo and behold, we will be accepted even if grudgingly. Now, before, before we, end, uh, we end this conversation, I wanted to have your personal opinion on, I mean, I was very um, uh, on President Obama, former President Obama. Now, yes. I, I'm, I'm from Cameroon, right? And, you know, being here at a time when he was, uh, when we elected him, because I elected him, I voted for him, yes. I was so proud. Yes. But I wanted to have your own thought, you being from Kenya, where his father was from. How, how did you feel? Really, I, I, my own view is that I always saw Obama as an American president. Right. This, this idea, which was a feel-good effect that he was of Kenyan origin, did not, I did not catch that fever. Mm -hmm. Because when you catch a fever such as that, the after effects 
can be devastating. And that is what Africa feels. Because Africans imagine that if yeah. there is an, a president of African origin, then lo and behold, money will begin to pour into Africa. Into Africa. And, and many people <laughs> now accuse yeah, many people now accuse President Obama for not doing things for them. But mm -hmm. why should he do? He was the President of the United not States the of America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if you appreciate that, you judge him as such. But right. those who criticize him for not giving money to Africa simply misunderstand. And this idea, I call it the cargo cult mentality. The mm -hmm. belief by us Africans that without any effort or part, the things that we long dreamt about will simply fall as if it was rain. It can't. Mm -hmm. And that is why Obama, to many Africans, was a disappointing president. But disappointing for who? For who? That's right. He, he was not our president. Yeah. <laughs> we had our own presidents who mm -hmm. should be disappointing us or making us happy. Yeah. But, so there is a sense in which I did not catch that fever. And because mm -hmm. I did not catch it, I don't feel let down. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I thought that our, our feel-good effect was always misguided. And yeah. that we had better do our things on our own, and, yeah. and uh, we we dependent on, on we dependent on, on, on Obama to solve our domestic problems, including the problem of Cameroon, which I think that uh, ECOWAS should deal with, which I yeah. think that AU should deal with, but they have chosen not to deal with it. And mm -hmm. I think this is part of our problem, which we must mm -hmm. liberate ourselves from. Yes, the belief by a critical mass of us. Mm -hmm. that other people have our interests at their oh. heart. Not mm -hmm. true. And they have no business. The former president of the United States of America, Ronald Reagan, made a statement in the 1980s, which I love. He said, America does what is in America's interest. Yes. And I can't begrudge him. That is what America should do. When I hear President Trump saying America first, yes, it should be America first. Why should it be Kenya first? When <laughs> President Xi is doing anything, it is China first. Yeah, first. Yeah. And even if you want to be spiritual about it, even the Bible, Christ himself says, love others as you love yes, yourself. Yes, the very yeah. first love that you must have mm -hmm. is yourself. Then mm -hmm. the love overflows to cover the others. But mm -hmm. in our case, Many times we don't love ourselves. See the number, the amount of wigs that we import from other parties in order for our women to wear that we may say that they look good. Yeah. Look at the bleaching creams I know. that our women have to have so that we may say they are good. Yeah, I know. We must love ourselves first before mm -hmm. others love us. Brother Piero. It was a Thank wonderful, you, uh, we had a wonderful time with you today. It was a wonderful conversation. It was a fascinating conversation. I learned a lot. And I hope we, and I know, we're going to have many other discussions where we'll hopefully, at the end of this COVID-19, we'll be able to meet again and talk, you know, about things that we do to further, you know, the progress and uh, the goals of uh, Africa as Pan-Africanists. Brother, I love you, and I believe in you, and I Thank trust you. you. I trust you, you that you will stay well, and your family will be well too. So, um, goodbye, and God bless you, and God bless your family. Um, Thank you very much. Yes. Hey. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Thank definitely. You. Definitely. Definitely, my brother. Definitely.